Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you, and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Thanks, Ray. If you guys would, please pray with me. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for the salvation that Peter just says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, it's according to your great mercy that, that we can be saved, that we could even come today and um, open your word and, and gather around this, this gospel that unites us, this good news of what Christ has done for us. Lord, I, I pray that uh, in these next few minutes you would use me, a, a fallible man, um, to uh, just expound upon the infallible truth of your word. God, I pray that um, Christ would be exalted and, and magnified, that, um, yeah, that, that I would just hide behind the cross and, and that we might be able to see the beauty and, and the riches and the glory that we have in Christ and that that might just stir and evoke in us great, great worship and just stir our affections to love him and trust him. God, we love you. We thank you for giving us your word and giving us a, a day that we can set aside to um, just worship you and, and, and study your word and enjoy you. Um, a day of rest. Let us find rest in Christ today. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, as I said earlier, I really am looking forward this fall to walking through First and Second Peter. If you've never read these books, um, I'd encourage you guys to read them. These, these books were written um, to churches in, in the early church, and they were circulated around, and basically, where I now come and, and preach a sermon to you, they would be just read out loud in one sitting, which is really interesting. We, you know, we'll, we'll go verse by verse through this. I think it'll take us about 15, 16 weeks to get through everything, but I'd encourage you guys just one time this week to just sit down and maybe read it or read it out loud. Uh, it takes about, I, I, I did it, I recorded it, put it up online for those of you who don't like to read. You can listen to it. It took about 15 minutes. It's, it's really quick um, just to read First Peter. But in, in First and Second Peter, we're going to go through a whole slew of topics. We're going to obviously talk about the gospel. We're talking about joy, holiness. Uh, next week, we'll talk about walking in holiness. We'll talk about community. We'll talk about how we relate to the world. We'll talk about the Trinity, the end times, suffering, God's sovereignty, the work of the Holy Spirit, what the church is. We'll even talk about the spiritual realm. We'll talk about false teachers, the Word of God. I mean, it's endless. We're just, we're, all, all of these topics are coming out. Um, but we, we believe our, our goal here is in expository preaching is to walk through verse by verse through books of the Bible. And hopefully it will help build you a, a biblical theology as we study the counsel of God's word. 
And so our prayer in doing this is that you guys would see the gospel of Christ and his glory, and in doing so, all of us, Christian and non, we'd repent of our sins, place our faith in Jesus Christ, and walk in this good news, walk in response to this good news. And so I love that we get to start with this passage. You know, I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm like, you know, there's nothing really huge application, it's just gospel, which I love. I, I love that when we start this series, when we start walking through First Peter, I'm just like, this sets the foundation. It's, and it's going to come up again and again and again every single week, but this just lays a great gospel foundation. So as we look at this, I even want, you know, a lot of times I was just tempted to jump down to verse 3. Because a lot of times, you know, when we read these verses, we just skip over a verse. You know, it's like, okay, Peter's saying hi to his friends, you know, saying all this spiritual talk. All right, let's get to the meat. That's verse three. Well, in verse one and two, what's interesting is it sets the context, not only for today and our passage today, but for the entire book. In, in these two verses, which just look like a greeting, we see two really important things going on here. We see who the letter is written to, which is important, and we see this thing called the Trinitarian gospel. We see Father, Son, and Spirit working together. So in, in verse 1, Peter says that he is an apostle of Jesus Christ. That means he saw Christ in the resurrected state after he had lived and died, as he said, in accordance with the scriptures and rose from the dead. Peter saw him, witnessed him with his own eyes. And then he's, he's writing to these churches. Historians like to pin it around 64 to 68 AD. They said it was sometime after Nero started reigning in Rome where Peter's writing this from. Nero persecuted a lot of Christians there. But I think tradition says Peter died around 68 AD, so in the 60s, in the 60s. And he's writing to these churches that are spread out all over Asia Minor, which is nowadays Turkey. So if you guys know about where that is, and, and they're spread all over because about 600 years before, after the Babylonian exile, it's called the diaspora, where they were sent and they were just spread out. And they said, you know what, you, you Jewish people are no longer going to have a land, we're just going to send you all over so that, that way you can't kind of rally together. Um, like, remember when we walked through Nehemiah, how they all came back to Jerusalem? So they kind of just sent them out. This is after the uh, Babylonian exile. And so Peter calls them elect exiles because they're exiled there. But what's interesting about this, and, and we'll see this as we get more and more into it, is that they were the elect exiles that, that were suffering. And, th and their suffering wasn't necessarily persecution. Um, it, it's, they were more um, exiles in their own societies. They, they used to be, as believers, the, the society used to revolve around them. Because, you know, in Jerusalem, the temple was in the center of the town, and so they would all gather around it. That's where they went to go do their business. That's where they went to go trade. That's where they went to go study. That's where they went to go worship. That's where the family life existed around the temple. And so now, not, not only are they far from Jerusalem, but even in their pagan societies, they as Christians have kind of been pushed to the margins of society. Which, if you guys are sitting there, you're probably going, man, that sounds a little bit like what's happening in the church today with us as, as we're being pushed out to the edges of society, ignored, rejected. And so I go, well, this book's pretty applicable to us. It, it, it is pretty applicable to us. But something even deeper in those words, elect exiles, we, obviously we get the word exiles because they're pushed on the margins of society and, and the society rejects them and in their homes in heaven. But elect is, in, is explained in verse 2, which we see is just kind of a bunch of spiritual jargon he throws on to the end of a greeting. But what we see is that they're elect exiles according to the foreknowledge of God. According to the foreknowledge of God. This word foreknowledge literally means to know before. To know before. And, and this word no comes from a biblical concept, a covenantal um, term that, that's just an intimacy, almost the way that a husband knows a wife. And so basically what it's saying to for no is to for love. And so he's saying he, he for loved us. So we are elect exiles according to the for loving of God, that, that he loved us even before the world was formed. That's what it says in Ephesians 1. Before the world was crafted, God foreknew us. He foreloved us. He had it in his mind to save a people for his glory. That's why 1 John says, we love because he first loved us. So we also, as Christians, we are elect exiles. 
We are elected because we've been loved by God. Now, how does this all relate to salvation, being elect exiles? This means, as I said earlier, as before time began, God had it in his sovereign love in his mind to set us apart, to save us, to reconcile us back to him, and then use us as messengers of reconciliation in this world. And then, eventually, one day when we pass through death, we're brought into glory. We're brought into sharing in the riches, sharing in the glory, sharing in the inheritance of Christ. And that's exactly what the very next phrase says. It says, in the sanctification of the Spirit. The sanctification of the Spirit, which to sanctify literally means to set apart, to set apart. And so God set us apart as his people. This is the initial act of the Holy Spirit where we're set apart unto the Father as his own. That's where we're consecrated. That's where we're claimed by God to be made holy like Christ. And so this sanctification is, is it's almost like the, in, the implementation or the carrying out of the foreknowledge, the plan that God had before time began to save us and to love us and to bring us into his glory. And so this is the carrying out of his foreknowledge, of his forelove for us. It, and then we see that the way that this happens is by Christ's blood. And so that's why we see this Trinitarian gospel, right? We see Father, Spirit, and now we see the Son, the work of the Son. All of this was done for the, for the purpose of obedience to Christ and for the sprinkling with his blood. That's what it says right there at the end of verse 2. And so our response to the gospel is obedience to God, which is what? Faith. It's faith. It's faith in the gospel. It's repenting of our sins, turning away from our foolishness, turning away from the world's desires, turning away from what our sinful hearts desire. And it's believing in Jesus, knowing that he has done it all. This is good news that should change us and evoke a response in us and, and move us to action, move us to repent of our sins and to look to Christ for salvation and believe in him. And, and then, as Romans says, walk by faith, for the righteous live by faith. So this is what the gospel does to us. And, and I, I want to be really clear that we don't do anything. This is good news. It's not good advice. It's good news. You don't do the news. You receive the news. And you live your life according to whatever the news says, but you don't do anything. The only thing that we do is kind of bring sin to the table, and then that kind of has to, you know, set all of the gospel in motion. And so what we do is, is we bring our sin to the table, and, and then God, from eternity past to eternity future, he takes care of all of it. He gives us good news. And so if you haven't ever heard this gospel before, and I continue to explain as we walk through this, if you haven't, my, my plea for you is just to, to think about this. Just think about this. Inquire this. Go, have I heard this before? If I've heard it before, have I accepted it before? And if I haven't, why? Why haven't I accepted this before? Because this gospel that we speak of is of first and utmost importance. There's nothing else more important that you can do with your entire life than to think about who is God? What is the gospel? Why does this matter? What is truth? And so my appeal to you today, my appeal to you every week will to be look upon the Lord Jesus Christ for he alone is worthy of praise. This is our everything. That's why Peter starts with it and he's gonna keep coming back to it over and over and over. So if, if you're sitting there and you go, you know what, Michael, I don't think I need to be saved. I don't think I need to be saved. I don't really want to be saved. I want to make an appeal to you from 1 Peter because again and again, we're going to see our need for salvation. The way one pastor describes it is this. If, if we find out that, you know, a plane is going to crash into this building, even if you guys don't feel like you need to be saved, the reality is you need to be saved. You need to get out of here. You need to heed the advice of somebody saying, move, run away from destruction, be saved, run into salvation. And so my appeal over and over and over, what, what we'll do is, is we'll see even throughout this, I'll just give you a quick overview. There are things that we can see in this, in this book. I'll just stay in First Peter of what we're saved from and what we're saved for. 
Okay, we are saved from the disease of our sins. It says that in 1 Peter 2, verse 24. I'll, I'll read these um, for us. So 1 Peter 2, verse 24 says this. It says, He himself, Christ, bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you have been healed. We're no longer wounded, now we're healed. And then in, in chapter 3, verse 18 It says, for Christ has also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh and being made alive in the spirit. And so not only are we saved from the disease of our sins, we're saved from the guilt of our sins. He took our unrighteousness, we're no longer counted unrighteous before God, and he's given us his righteousness. In chapter four, verse 17, it says this, it says, For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel? So we are saved from God's judgment because Christ took our judgment at the cross. And then I'll show you one more. In chapter 5, verses 8, Peter's encouraging the church. He says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And so not only are we saved from our sin and God's judgment, but we're saved from the devil himself. We are saved from this devil that, that has it out in the world today. To, he's seeking out to destroy us and to consume us and to bring us down so that God would get no glory. Well, obviously, we know that there's good news. We, we see, too, what we're saved for. We're not just saved from stuff. We're saved to something. We're saved, as, as it says in chapter 2, verse 25, it says, For you were like straying sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. We've been saved now to be with our loving shepherd who sought us out and saved us. We were the one sheep that strayed from the 99 and he went out of his way to go get us and rescue us and bring us back into the fold. We also see in chapter five, verse four, that we will receive this unfading crown of glory and we get to inherit the glory of heaven. And then later in that chapter in verse 10, it says that that we will share in the glory of Jesus Christ. In chapter 4, verse 13, it even says that we'll have this everlasting joy for as sure as this world's sufferings are, even more sure in heaven is our glory, is our joy, is our eternal bliss with him forever. And so not only are are we saved from bad things and from hell, you know, a lot of times some preachers just say, you know what, there's two places you can go, one's bad, one's good, so look to Jesus, you go to the better place. The gospel is so much more full and so much more rich than that. There's a lot more good news than that. A lot more good news. And so, as we walk through verses 3 to 12, so all that's just in the greeting. That's just Peter saying hi, okay? As as we walk through these next few verses, we'll see that this salvation I just spoke of, it, it gives us, it kind of brings us three benefits, three things that we get to enjoy It gives us three gifts in addition to salvation, in addition to eternal life. Those who are saved by this gospel get to partake in three things we see here. There's a lot more than three things. There's just three things here in the text. So the first thing we see is found in verse three to five. Salvation gives us hope. Salvation gives us hope. Look in verse three. He starts by just blessing God for his great mercy. He says it's by your mercy that we're even born again. It's by your mercy that we're born again. This new birth is what theologians like to call a big word, if you guys are taking notes, regeneration. Regeneration. Just sound it out, you'll get close enough. Regeneration, that's the new birth. It is a supernatural, efficacious, mysterious work of the Holy Spirit where he makes us alive. He gives us a new birth. It occurs beneath and it occurs prior to our positive response to the gospel. See, because we as as sinners, we sin by nature and by choice. And so we, apart from the grace of God, dead in our trespasses and sins, we do nothing other than that what we want, sin. Before we're saved, all we want is sin. We we want things for ourselves. We want our comfort. We want 
our approval of other people. We want whatever it is. We, we want things for ourselves. Our selfishness is what drives us. And so the sin is, is what we always desire. And so that's, that's the state of our heart. And so what God does is, is he's saying, you, you need a new heart even to receive the gospel. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in you, I'm going to take your heart of stone, give you a heart of flesh, and now you can, by the faith that I've also given you, you can now receive the gospel. You can now look upon the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. It's amazing. Every single thing that he does. I mean, if, if he doesn't give us a new heart, we see the gospel and we just keep rejecting him or keep being indifferent towards him. We, we need a heart softened to the grace of God. We need ears to hear, as Jesus says, eyes to see, hearts to behold. We, we need that from God. And so what God does is he gives us a new heart and we believe and, and we're born again into the kingdom of God. It's amazing. Now, as, as you guys think about being born into the kingdom of God, you probably think well, there's two ways to become a citizen somewhere. Well, you can be born or you can go through this really strenuous, really long assimilation process where you have to you know, apply for stuff and show that you're a good citizen and basically work your way to be a citizen. And so I think the gospel in the Bible is very clear that we can't be saved by good behavior. There's no citizenship test that I could pass, especially when, when me, Michael, sinner, I come to the table and I go, and God says, why, why should I let you in? This is before I'm saved. Well, you shouldn't. If we're being honest with myself, you shouldn't let me in. And so what he does is he says, well, I'm going to give you new life and, and you're going to be born into this new kingdom. And so nothing you do will ever take away your citizenship. Nothing. We're not saved by our good works, our will, our watchfulness, or our wishful thinking. We, we need to be born again. And so through Christ's life, death, and resurrection, we're born into a living hope. We, just, we sang about that, but it, it says it here. We're born into a living hope, verse 3. Born into a living hope, into the kingdom of God, where now we are citizens. And, and how does this happen? Well, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This, this is the inheritance we get to have, okay? It's, it's in heaven. It's protected by the Holy Spirit. And it's, it's basically this. It's being with Jesus and sharing in his glory, that is the inheritance that we have. Prom- I mean, there's probably, we'll be spending all of eternity figuring out what all that means. But in short, boiled down, it's that. It's being with Jesus and sharing in his glory. Being with him. Being found in him. And, and, and this inheritance is imperishable. This is what it says in verse 4. Imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. In other words, by being sealed by the Holy Spirit and having it kept in heaven, there is nothing in heaven or on earth or under the earth that can separate this or diminish this. That's, that's why Paul, at the end of Romans 8, he, he gets into it and he says, I, I'm convinced life, death, angels, demons, things present nor things to come, anything in all creation, under creation, or above creation can separate me from the love of God. There's nothing. My sin, the devil, sure, he prowls around like a roaring lion, but he loses. We know that. We, we heard about that back in Genesis 3. He's losing He's going to lose. He's going to be crushed. He's, a, he's extinguished. God is bigger and more powerful than that. And so we, and we'll sing this in a minute, we are held fast by a triune God. We are held fast. And, and then he gave us, he gave us faith, which, which is what this verse says. In verse 5, it says, we're being guarded through faith. God even gave us the faith that is guarding our salvation right now. God gave us the very faith that is guarding our salvation, which one day we will experience. So he protects us from any loss of faith, any unbelief, or anything that threatens our inheritance. The only thing, and and I will be clear about this, the only thing that can keep you from heaven is not believing in Jesus, right? Trusting other things, yourself, trusting in a, a false god, trusting in other things, putting your faith in other treasures, other hopes, Instead of putting your faith in Christ, that's the only thing that can keep you out of heaven. So what God does is he inspires us, he nourishes us, he strengthens us and builds us and gives us the very faith that is necessary to be saved. That's what Romans says. It's, it's by grace you've been saved through faith and even that faith is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God for eternal life. 
And so if you hear that, you're probably sitting there going, man, does, I, I want to ask you, does that give you hope? Does it give you hope to hear that? That, that there is nothing at all ever that could ever separate you if you are united to Christ, your union with Christ is stronger than any union you've ever had with sin. Does that give you hope? If, if that doesn't give you hope, well, I would say repent of your sins and believe in him and it can give you hope. And, and if you are a Christian, it should give you hope because you should realize that outside of my sin, I've done nothing in the story of redemption. I like to say all the time, God allowed no place for me in the gospel to do anything. Otherwise, I would find a way to mess it up. And, and I love that God in his sovereign providential wisdom knew what big of a screw up I was and said, you know what? I'm not going to give Michael any responsibilities. I'll take care of it all. So that way I know it's perfect. That way I know it's glorious. And that way I can hope in it. And I'm like, man, no pressure. It's good news. That's what Christ said at the cross. It's finished. It's done. He didn't say, I did my part. Now you do yours. He said, it's done. It's finished. I've done it all. The, the perfect God has, has loved us in such a way that he's made a way to salvation where we cannot mess it up at all and no one else or anything else can interfere with that. Nothing. Nothing. And so that gives me confidence knowing, walking towards my future. I mean, I've, I've sat with, with men who are dying of cancer and they just go, I'm at, I'm at peace with where I'm going. And then they make jokes about their cancer over lunch. I'm like, how can you do that? And he said, because I know what waits for me on the other side of this cancer. It's either more life with you, which I said, thank you, or something far greater, being with my Savior. And so, and, and we'll see this in, in, the, in the next point. We'll see as, as we walk through suffering, how that shows our faith, how that plays itself out. But I can know going forward, I go, I know who holds my future. I know where it's found. I know how it's, it's sealed with the Holy Spirit. It's hidden in heaven. It's with Christ, and I get to be with him one day. And so not only that gives me hope, but leading to point two, which is kind of Peter's logical progression here, it also gives me joy. So salvation gives joy. Look at the beginning of verse six. He says, in this you rejoice. In this, what is this? Well, the gospel. That's basically all he's explained so far in five verses. That's all he's talked about is just the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. So in what we rejoice? In the gospel we rejoice. And, and the joy that the gospel brings is so deep and so unshakable that it exists in any circumstance. Just as Josh said earlier, it, it exists in all circumstances. All of it. That's why he says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while of necessary, you've been grieved with various trials. Remember, these people are being grieved. These people are suffering. These people are, are having, a, they're being pushed to the sides of society in Asia Minor. Peter, where he's writing this from, I mean, he's got Nero breathing down his back who, who lit Christians on fire. I mean, this is suffering. He said, yeah, yeah maybe we have some suffering right now. Maybe we're, we're grieved by trials, but, but we have this joy in the gospel. We have this joy in Christ. And Peter even uses this imagery in verse seven to explain what happens when our faith is tested. He says, well, you, you guys know how gold's made. Gold goes into the fire and it's refined. All the impurities come out. And so he says, so too, your faith, which is even more valuable than gold, is refined in the fire, the trials, the testing of our faith. Now, I know a lot of times, you and I maybe, when, when we're in the midst of trials, in the midst of sufferings, hardships, we're tempted to think that sufferings or grief or trials or tribulations or hardships, those things maybe might prevent our joy or maybe postpone our joy. Maybe we just go, okay, well, there's a light at the end of the tunnel I can't be happy now, but maybe one day I will be. But, but what God did, his, his, his providential intention of our sufferings, of our grief, is for one purpose. Well, many purposes, but, but one purpose we see here is to refine our faith so that, at the end of verse 7, when Christ returns, our faith might win praise and glory and honor. Do you see that? 
I'm, I'm not making this, this is what it says. It says, our faith might result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So when Jesus returns, we'll see two things going on here. First, his glory will be magnificently reflected in the mirror of our faith. In other words, to use Paul's imagery, the more pure and the more refined the gold of our faith is, the more clearly his worth and his beauty will be reflected in and through us. And then secondly, we see that since God exalts Christ above all things, we who share in his glory will they'll give praise and honor and glory to us who now have been credited and imputed the righteousness of Christ through his life, death, and resurrection. We will hear at the end, well done, good and faithful servant, as he gives us the crown of glory that chapter 5 talks about. I, I, want, I want you guys to hear this clear. Divinely orchestrated circumstances. Divinely orchestrated circumstances that purify our faith, what they do is this. They prepare us for Christ's return. They prepare us to see Jesus. So as we live our lives, I I used this imagery last week when we were preaching through the Psalms. We were finishing up our series then. I said, we live with our hearts in heaven and our feet in Hewitt. Okay, we, we live kind of between these two worlds, this reality of uh, that's where I want to be. I want to be in heaven. I want to be with Jesus, but he's left me here on purpose, with a mission, with a vision. And so my joy right now can be a present reality in the midst of my sufferings that I endure, but also it's a future reality, an actualized reality of the blessings to come for us in heaven. And so I, I like to say the gospel is not just something that when, when times are hard, we just reach out and grab onto and it's just a thing, like a good luck charm that might make us feel better when we're down. That, that, that so cheapens the gospel to just say it's something that we, just, we can grab onto and it, it just makes us feel better, it lifts our spirits. I like to say the gospel is like good glasses that gives us lens, it gives us clear vision into what actually is going on here. When I understand the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, what it is for me, I get to see all of my life through the lens of I'm being made like Jesus. I'm being made like him. I'm being turned more. And so for the Christian, suffering is far from senseless, far from discouraging. Rather, it's an expression of God's love to us because we become more like him. And so I can know, I I love saying, if you grab God's sovereignty and his love, right, I can know the all-sovereign God in all of his power and the all-loving God in all that he ordains, he would only allow things, Romans 8, only allow things to happen for my good and for his glory, that I might know him and be found in him. So I don't just grab onto the gospel as some good luck charm or some pick-me-up. I welcome, I, I welcome suffering like a good friend. I, I, I love it. I, I, I press into it because, why? Because it's gonna make me more like Christ and I'll know him better. This is what one pastor in Oklahoma says. He says this, our salvation, our hope, our inheritance that's kept in heaven for us, it serves as a foundation and a reservoir. A foundation and a reservoir of deep delight in God in order to sustain us and strengthen us. In order to sustain and strengthen the Christian soul when everything else threatens to destroy us. You guys hear that? The gospel is is the great, it it gives us this deep delight in God that, that can satisfy us and sustain us and strengthen us that when all else looks like it's against us, and all else seeks to destroy us and pry us away from him, we got to go back to the promise that nothing will ever separate us. Nothing has more power than God, and, and he is holding us fast. And so this is what it is to suffer well. This is what it is to walk through hardship well, is to see everything through the lens of the gospel. The suffering, suffering well is, is a mark of a growing Christian, really a spiritually mature Christian. I mean, you can tell a lot about how somebody has been walking with the Lord faithfully over years of what happens when they suffer. 
It's, it's, it's this, this thing that they've just, they've kept feeding their soul, growing deeper and deeper, stronger roots in their hearts. And they've just been ministering the gospel to themselves over and over and over and over and over. And they're like, I know one day I'm going to need this. And even if I don't need it, I get to know Christ better now. Now, in this very moment. And so the, the faith that God gives us makes us able and capable then to love Jesus, as it says here in verse 8, to love Jesus without seeing him, to trust in him without seeing him right now. Now, obviously, we see Christ in God's word, but he's talking about to, this is after Christ already went back to heaven. And so these people didn't see Jesus in the flesh like Peter did. And, and, and this is what he's saying. He's saying, that's what it is to have faith, is to believe without seeing. That's why Jesus says, blessed are you who believe and do not see. That's why it's important to talk about this right now, because knowing Christ will give us this inexpressible joy. But there's something else. There's, there's one last thing, and, and the gospel, there's nothing more hopeful than it, nothing more joyful than it, but also nothing more rewarding, which we see in point three, which is that salvation brings privilege. Salvation brings privilege. Now, I know that word privilege, you're kind of like, what? I thought that God shows no partiality. This, this is what it means. It, it means that there's something special. There's something special special. And, and Peter uses two examples to show how special this salvation is. He uses the example of the prophets in the Old Testament, and then he talks about the angels at the end. He says that prophets, they searched, they inquired, they just, they wondered. They're like, who is this Messiah, and when is he coming? Because in the Old Testament, they had a law that was incredibly unattainable. They had this sacrificial system that was strenuous, and, and it kept weighing down on them. And then they had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of prophecies that needed to be fulfilled. And so as time went and God kept sending more and more prophets to make more and more prophecies, the bar's just getting higher and higher and higher. And so they're like, who on earth? I mean, they're studying the law. They're hearing these prophecies and, they're, and they're, their anticipation is growing. They're like, who can do all of this? Who can suffer like this? Who can suffer like this? Now I want you to see in verse 11, at the end of verse 11, we see the suffering and the glory. And, and all throughout the letters from Peter, we see suffering and glory hand in hand. Not only that our glory will come after our suffering, but also that the glory that, that we have been promised could not happen without the suffering of Christ. What he went through on our behalf. Because, see, he, he took our sin and bore our guilt, bore our shame, and faced God's wrath for our sins so that we don't have to. And then what, what God did is, is way before Christ came, hundreds of years before Christ came, he was telling prophets, speaking through prophets, he's saying, Christ is going to suffer and you will be saved. You will be glorified. You who were not my people are now my people. And he's telling people like Moses and David and Isaiah, from, from Eden all the way through the Exodus, even into the exile and beyond, they're just waiting. And as they waited, God continued to reveal more and more and more and more and more. Who is this Messiah? And they're sitting there, and, and as they study the word, their, their realization of the, their sin is growing, but also their anticipation for glory is growing and then when, when Jesus arrived, what did he say? He said, I was the one that Moses talked about. I was the one that all the prophets wrote about. I was the one that this whole book is about. I'm the one. I, I came here to fulfill all of this. I came here to live perfectly on your behalf, to, to walk according to the law in a way you never could. And then to take your place on the cross as if I broke every single law like you did so that then I could take your unrighteousness, give you my righteousness. That's what happened when Christ came. He is the Messiah that, that the Old Testament spoke of. The prophets of old, this is the Jesus, the, the good news, the gospel. I mean, you guys can get a, a reference Bible, read through the New Testament, and you will be incredibly just like blasted with how much it quotes, it references, it alludes to the Old Testament. I have a book that's like 800 pages thick called The References 
of the Old Testament in the New. And it's not like, it, it doesn't explain all of them. It just says like Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, reference, and then just gives you the list. And then it's like Matthew 1.2, reference, and gives you the list. And it's hundreds of pages long. Hundreds and hundreds of pages long. So as, as the Old Testament's being written, everyone's just anticipating this Savior. They're saying, there's good news coming. There is good news. There's gospel coming. And it's found in Christ. He is the good news. He is the gospel. That's what Colossians, Paul tells the church in Colossae. He says this, he says, in him all of the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile himself to all things, whether in earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. So this is what Peter says in verse 10, this salvation that the prophets who prophesied about, the grace, the gospel that was to be yours. This is the gospel that is ours. This is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. This is the gospel that God planned before the foundation of the world. This is the gospel that the Holy Spirit revealed to the prophets and to the apostles. This is the gospel that we, 1 Corinthians 15, we received in which we stand and we're being saved. This is the gospel that Peter blesses God back in verse 3, 4. This is the gospel that gives us an inheritance in heaven. This is the gospel that gives us eternity with Jesus where we get to share in his glory and rule and reign with him. This is the gospel that it says at the end of verse 12, the angels long to look into, and Hebrews takes it up another notch. It says angels wish to trade places with us. That's this gospel. This is the gospel that... Of, of highest importance, it's, it's the gospel that I stake my entire eternity on. I, I've spent my whole life, I've devoted my entire life to proclaim this gospel. To tell people, repent of your sins and believe in him. This is the gospel I'm pleading with you. I plead with the Lord daily. I say, oh Lord, just bring people to salvation. There's, there's nothing else. If we do all of this stuff, but we don't preach the gospel, we're, why are we gathering? If, if this is not what we gather around, if this is not what we celebrate, if this is not what we grow in, this is not what we proclaim, and this is not what we call sinners to, we're wasting our time. Absolutely wasting our time. But this is the gospel that, that I'm, I'm praying. I'm like, Lord, shape us by this. Mold us into the image of Christ by this gospel. This is the gospel that will transform us from one degree of glory to the next. This is the gospel that gives us hope, that gives us joy, and that gives us a privilege that's unlike anything else. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. And my prayer for you today is that you would know him and be found in him. This gospel is for you. If you haven't repented of your sins, repent and believe this gospel. Let me pray for us.